I, I, I would introduce myself, Peter. Yes, yes, introduce yourself, yes. Yeah, just a couple of, uh, of words. I, I'm professor of history of science uh, at the University of Bologna. And uh, at the moment, uh, we are at the very uh, final phase of an ERC project called Alchemist. You can see it in the, in the slide, in the first slide, which is uh, devoted to the history of uh, Greek or Egyptian alchemy. And uh, this is basically what I'm going to present today as part of the research that we are we have been carrying on in the past five years um, we in the framework of this of this project and thank you very much peter for for inviting me to to give this uh, this talk and it's a pleasure to be here and i hope to be clear and uh, and then there will be time for uh, some questions at the end of the of the talk uh, whenever you want I'm to put your question can i just say put your questions in chat people uh, we won't be having all questions at the end, but Matteo says he'll be able to read the chat and answer your question from chat. If for some reason he can't see them, I'll read them out to him. So, Thank you. As Thank I say, you. put your question in that little thing at the bottom called chat. Thank you very much. Matteo, please now begin. Okay, perfect. So the, the title of my talk today is, the topic is Greek or Roman uh, alchemy, as, as Peter was uh, sharing by email. The full title is Alchemy in the Greek or Roman Egypt, the early development of Chimeia and the transmutation of uh, metals. And um, as we sh shall see in, uh, in a moment, basically, and um, the term chemistry, as well as the, the ancient term alchemy, stems from an ancient Greek word, namely, moment, namely, chimeia, with different uh, Byzantine spellings, uh, chimeia, chimia, or, or chemia, actually. And this term, chimeia, was first introduced by the uh, Greco-Egyptian alchemist Dosimus of Panopolis in the third century CE. Basically, Zosimus used this word in the framework of a wider discussion on the boundaries of this craft of alchemy, actually, is a techne according to the Greek vocabulary. An alchemical book, he claims, must not only explain how silver can be turned into gold, but it must also include a wider spectrum of practices that could produce a variety of chromatic transformations in all kinds of metals. According to the Byzantine lexicon Suda from the 10th century, also the same term Chimeia was used to refer to the 28 alchemical books written by Zosimus, which had been grouped together under the general title of Chemeutica, you can read it in the slide. Chemeutica means basically books on chimeria, so on alchemy. And according to this entry, these 28 books were basically addressed to, the, to the, one of the pupils of, of Dosimus called Theosebeia. And uh, where uh, actually each book was marked by a letter of the Greek alphabet. We will see it better in the, in the next uh, slides. The main topics covered by these books, by Zosimus, was firm, were firmly rooted in a rich technical, technical and artisanal tradition, which alchemy inherited and reshaped when it took its first steps in Greco-Roman Egypt. Already in classical antiquity, a wide range of artisanal practices exploited properties of the natural world that, would, that we would call chemical today. One can retrospectively detect a variety of chemically relevant passages, so to speak, which are scattered in many Greek or Roman texts dealing with different technologies, from metallurgy to pharmacy, from dyeing techniques, to cosmetics. However, the variety of the described procedure is so wide that it would be risky and perhaps anachronistic to reconstruct some supposed classical view on chemistry as a unified and well-defined field of inquiry in the Greek or Roman world. Against this fragmented picture, one must observe that some practices started to be grouped together in the first centuries 
uh, CE in Greco-Roman Egypt by basically by um, a group of authors who started to recognize a specific set of technologies as a set of, uh, say, as a consistent set of practices that we, we might call alchemical practices. These, these, uh, these uh, books, actually, these writings are in particular the four books uh, attributed to the uh, philosopher, to the Greek philosopher Democritus. That, and these four books, uh, this is the first, uh, let's say, picture in the, in the slide, dealt with four main chemical subjects. The making of gold, namely a set of techniques to dye metals yellow, the making of silver, that is uh, different uh, coloring techniques uh, to whiten metals, the making of artificial gemstones and purple uh, dyeing. The same range of uh, technologies, if you want, are also covered by the Leiden Stockholm papyri, which are two uh, Greek uh, papyri from the third century CE that were discovered in Egypt at the end of the, of the 19th centuries. My talk today will focus on this early alchemical literature, which I will try to contextualize by looking at two specific uh, points, if you want, uh, two specific uh, aspects. The first point is, uh, has to do with the ancient and modern definitions of alchemy. So how, how chimeia was defined in antiquity and how it is defined in modern scholarship, you, if you want, in modern the secondary literature. The second main point of my talk will be on ancient practices of metallic transmutation, basically the making of gold and the making of silver, since metallic transmutation, so how to, how to produce gold or silver out of vile metals like lead, copper, iron, was one of the main purposes of ancient alchemy and in general, let's say, of alchemy throughout the centuries. In order to, to address these two points, it will be necessary to look at the, at the at ancient alchemical tradition in different languages, because we know that Greek alchemical text, uh, part of, Greek, of the Greek alchemical literature is preserved in its original language, that is Greek, ancient Greek, but um, a, a vast corpus of alchemical writings written in the, in the ancient Greek or Roman world were actually translated into Syriac and Arabic from the, the, the end of the eighth, beginning of the ninth century, especially in Baghdad, in, in the area around Baghdad. And uh, for instance, just to give you a couple of examples, for Zosimos of Panopoli, Panopolis, uh, the, the alchemist that we, we just mentioned, one of the most important, uh, let's say, um, part of his book, of his writings, is preserved in Syriac translation. We have 12 alchemical books by Zosimus preserved in Syriac translation. This is a, the picture of a man manuscript kept at the Cambridge University Library, where we have this uh, translation that I'm currently editing and translating into English. As for the Arabic tradition, for instance, we have two very, let's say, big okay, books by Zosimus, or attributed to Zosimus at least, uh, preserved in Arabic translation. This is uh, the book of the keys of, for the art, this is the Kitab Mafatih Asana, which is uh, basically a very long commentary by Zosimus on Pseudo-Democritus alchemical books. And is preserved in a manuscript kept uh, in Cairo, uh, the Dar al Qutub, basically the National Library of Cairo, and his manuscript Kemeya, Kimiya 23. And another important uh, text uh, attributed to Zosimus in Arabic is this Tome of Images, that is uh, basically a very long dialogue in 13 books uh, between Zosimus and Theosebeia. But uh, let's say, uh, now let's start from the first point that I mentioned at the beginning, basically, ancient definitions of alchemy, but before addressing this point, let's also have a very quick look at the 
etymology of the term chimeia or alchemy, actually, because since we are discussing its meaning, it's important also to have a, a clue on, on the origins of this, of, this, uh, of this term, of this word. Basically, when we look at the term, at the modern term alchemy, chemistry in English, or uh, alchemy and chimie in, in French, or alchemy and chemie in, 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 in German, and also the, the names that today are used actually to, to call their practitioners, so alchemist, alchemist, or their alchemist. We, we know that all these, uh, let's say, vocabulary stems from the Latin alchemia or chimia, and alchemista and chimista for the practitioner. And as I, I was mentioning at the very beginning, these two terms share a common etymology. This common etymology has been already stressed by modern historians of alchemy. For instance, Lawrence Principe and Bill Newman published in 1998 a seminal article in the journal Early Science and Medicine, and which basically has the title Alchemy versus chemistry, the etymological origins of a, an historiographic mistake. And in this article, they stressed how the common etymology of the terms alchemy and chemistry was already recognized by early modern scholars. For instance, Georg Agricola recognized the classical origin of the Latin term alchemia in his monumental work on mines and the art of mining, so the Re Metallica, published in 1556, one year after his, his death. As put very nicely by the historian of chemistry, Alan Rock, Agricola wanted to purify the spelling and clarify the etymology of the classical root of the Arabo-Greek or Latin word, alchemia. Indeed, the Latin term alchemia is a simple transliteration of an Arabic terms, alchemia or alchemia, you can see here basically, alchemia stems from these Arabic terms, alchemia or alchemia, where al is the simple, say, Arabic article, we have this term that through a Syriac transliteration, chemia, actually can be traced back to the Greek term chimeia, which is basically the term that we might translate either alchemy or chemistry, because basically is the same, that, and is the, is the term that basically uh, is at the beginning of these of this, uh, um, families, of, of this family of uh, uh, terms, uh, actually in the, in the later tradition. Now, the, the question is what actually chimeia means in Greek? And we basically don't know. That's one of the first problems. Or are these different interpretations, let's say, have been proposed by scholars regarding this chimeia word. This is a very short summary of the three main definitions that were proposed. Basically, chimeia or chimeia uh, can be a Greek word. So basically, the etymology might be Greek and is, according to the interpretation of some scholars, was linked to the Greek, let's say, uh, vocabulary of metallurgy, especially to the verb keo, that means actually to melt. Uh, recently, uh, an Achaean uh, possible etymology was proposed by Maddalena Rumor, and uh, basically, uh, according to this interpretation, chimeia might derive from my stem, from the term from the Akkadian verb kamu, that means to bake, to roast. And actually, we in the next, uh, uh, um, let's say, installment of these of this, uh, of this, uh, meetings, we will discuss, along with uh, Eduardo Escobar, the possible links between the Greek or Roman tradition, alchemical tradition, and, ancient, and the ancient Babylonian technical tradition. The, the, the third etymology that was proposed is to link chimeia with uh, an Egyptian term, keme or kemet, that means black, and is actually the name by which ancient Egyptians refer to their own countries, so to Egypt, basically. And this third etymology is uh, particularly interesting for us because basically this etymology points 
to the, to the place, to the country, Egypt, were actually the earliest alchemical treatises, like the, the text by Pseudo-Democritus, by Zosimus of Panopolis, were written between the first and the third century CE. After is, uh, the say, etymological uh, uh, questions, uh, uh, it's interesting also to, to see how, let's say, um, in the framework of, the, of this uh, multilingual tradition that we have been basically uh, referring to uh, up to now, we can find three different uh, definitions of the term chimeria, which share quite interesting elements and I think can help us to better identify the, the main features of this craft, of this techne in, in Greek. The three definitions actually date to the 10th, 11th century. They are almost contemporary and they are taken from three, let's say, kind of lexicographical uh, uh, books uh, written in the three different languages that we have mentioned, basically ancient Greek, Byzantine Greek actually, and this is the first uh, source, the, the lexicon Suda, uh, Arabic, that is the this Kitab al-Firist, so the book of the catalog by al-Nadim, and Syriac, and, and this is a lexicon bar, by the, say, the Syriac lexicographer Barbalu. Let's look at this definition one by one and to, to better contextualize and also see the, the common features of these three um, uh, sources. The first definition is taken from this Byzantine lexicon, actually the Byzantine Suda, is a kind of, uh, let's say, encyclopedias, encyclopedia written in the 10th century uh, AD, probably in Byzantium, and is that it, it collects a lot of uh, information taken from earlier sources. According to this, uh, to this uh, Byzantine lexicon, the term chimeria, so alchemy, would mean the making or the preparation, at a way in Greek, of gold and silver. And, uh, and it's interesting also to, 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 to note that after giving this definition the, um, of, the, of the lemma of the term chemeia, the entry continues by telling the history of the Roman emperor Diocletian, who would have burned all the books on the chemistry on chemeia of gold and silver in order to suppress the Egyptian rebellions, which were founded by the gold and silver produced by ancient alchemists. We have here a kind of political, let's say, um, impact of the alchemical, the alchemical art on the Greek um, Roman uh, Egypt, the Egypt under the, let's say, the, 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 the rule of, uh, of uh, Roman emperors. The second definition is taken from this book, the uh, book of the catalog by uh, the, the Persian uh, scholar Al-Nadim, uh, who, who was active in the 10th century uh, CE. As the name, as, as the same Al-Nadim explains, this book, this book of the catalog, is a kind of ancient annotated bibliography on the extant Arabic works available at his time on every field of knowledge. Al-Nadim describes his own work as an index of the books of all nations which are extant in the Arabic language script on every branch of knowledge. The tenth book is devoted to alchemy or alchemy, and we can read the following definition of, of uh, uh, alchemy, of uh, alchemy. So Muhammad ibn Isaac al-Nadim says, the adepts of the art of alchemy, and the, the art is a sina in, in, in Arabic, there's a kind of translation of techne, so the, of the craft of alchemy, and alchemy is alchemy, which is the art of making gold and silver without recourse to mining. This is actually the definition that is very similar to what we have in the Suda lexicon. And uh, according to, to, to Al-Nadim, actually, uh, the, the adepts, the followers, and say the practitioners of this art, um, were asserting that the science of the art was first discussed by Hermes, the sages, the sages, sorry. 
So basically, Hermes Trismegistus is, is, is pointed here as the founder of the alchemical art. The third example that is actually in this slide is taken from, from this lexicon uh, written by, by, by Barbalul, who was a scholar, a Syriac scholar, uh, working in Baghdad in the 11th century uh, CE. And according to the editor of this, of this lexicon, is, is a French um, uh, seriousist called Rubens Duval. According to Duval, uh, Barbalul described this in, 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 in his, uh, let's say, uh, explained in his lexicon a lot of uh, words according to explanations taken from earlier lexicographical uh, material. In any case, uh, the definition of uh, Chimelia, so the, the, this is basically, chimia is, the, is simply the transliteration in Syriac script of the term chimelia, so of alchemy. According to this definition, the chimelia is the work of the art of gold and silver. And there is someone who explains this word from the name kuma, this is a kind of, uh, let's say, power etymology, that is the eight stops, actually, Cuma is the name of the Pleiades in Syriac because this art is, a, is accomplished by uh, the eight, by uh, means of the eight mixtures. And this is a reference to basically the um, kind of uh, technical explanation, let's say, of, uh, uh, um, of, this, uh, um, of this terminology, of this term. Now, if we move to the modern scholarship, to the modern literature, basically we see that this focus on gold making, so on what in ancient Greek is called chrysopoeia, and also the focus with the, with the, with the making of precious metals, is one of the features that is often emphasized also in, by modern scholars looking at the Greek or Roman alchemical tradition. I will start with a very famous uh, definition of alchemy proposed by André Jean Festugère, is a, is a French scholar who is an expert of, ne of the Neoplatonic tr later tradition, who devoted the first, uh, the first uh, volume of his, of his uh, seminal work, actually, La Révélation d'Hermé Trismégiste, to the uh, to different cult sciences, among which we also find alchemy. And actually, it's very interesting if you look at the definition that I put the, the, the definition of Greek Egyptian alchemy in, in the slide. We can you can see that in, according to Festuger, Greek Egyptian alchemy is a kind of mixture of melange, as as it, as it, as it says, between the say metallurgy, especially the art of goldsmith, actually and neoplatonic, let's say, Aristotelian and uh, platonic uh, philosophy or philosophical tradition. So we have the, let's say, the, the practical component, his metallurgy with a special focus on, on gold or on, on, the work, on the working of precious metals, and the theoretical component is a kind of melange of uh, Plato and Aristotle with some reverie mystic, actually, so some kind of, uh, let's say, mystical dreams, if you want, in uh, according to, to Festuger's uh, definition. A second and very important uh, definition of, uh, of uh, alchemy was actually proposed by Joseph Needham, that is a very famous and important historian of science, especially of, uh, of uh, uh, Chinese science, was a biochemist, actually, and also a sinologist. He, he wrote this, uh, actually, monumental work, uh, Science and Civilization in China, where also, um, actually, in the fifth volume devoted to the, to the chemical arts, uh, he also addresses the question of the definition of alchemy in the Eastern tradition, so in China, and also in the Western tradition, if you want, especially in Greco-Roman Egypt. Um, according to uh, Needham, um, three main features of alchemy can be detected in the, in the Chinese tradition. He, he, basically, he used these labels to refer to these three features. Our fiction, that is the imitation of gold, you can see this fiction is quite uh, 
transparent, a refraction, that is the making of gold, and macrobiotics, that is actually the, the quest for, for a drug that, can pro, that is able to prolong uh, life, actually. And uh, in, in the, let's say, Western alchemical tradition, we only have, especially in the Greek or Roman tradition, we only have the first two elements, so our refraction and our refraction. And in all, in, in, moreover, uh, Needham tried to define ancient Greek or Roman alchemy by, by contrasting, let's say, the technology or the techniques of our fiction with the philosophy of our fiction. So in his opinion, there is a very strong dichotomy and contrast between these two concepts. And it, it, I, I, I want just to show you very briefly some of the definition that basically uh, um, Needham proposed of these two key terms. In his opinion, our fiction, that is actually uh, um, the gold faking, or if you want, the imitation of gold, is defined as the conscious imitation of gold and in general, let's say, of uh, any other precious. Uh, material, also silver or gemstones, often with the intent to deceive. So in his opinion, people working on our fiction were aware of making imitations of the precious metals. On the contrary, actually, our refraction here is the belief that it was possible to make gold indistinguishable from the natural gold, or even as good as the natural gold. And according to, uh, to Needham, this, uh, this uh, say, our fiction approach, if you want, was the conviction of philosophers rather than artists. And basically the self-deception was at the, at, the, at the basis of this, uh, of this idea of these protochemical philosophers, so of the alchemists, in Needham opinion, that were basically main, were basing their, their, their own idea on a, a kind of philosophical, if you want, um, uh, approach. So the, the, the Platonic and Aristotelian theory of matter rather than on artisanal practices. Now, in um, this uh, very strong uh, in, uh, dichotomy was used by Nida also to, uh, let's say, to classify and, 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 and somehow interpret the earlier alchemical sources that we mentioned at the beginning of this, of this talk. According to, 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 to Nida, the Leiden and Stockholm papyri were actually the, uh, the work of people let's say, of uh, our effective uh, practitioners. So people practition, that were practicing uh, our fiction. And Pseudo-Democritus for Alchemical Books and Zosimus of Panopolis, and in general, let's say, the, the, uh, the alchemical corpus were, was actually the work of people that were really believing that they were able to produce real gold through their, throughout their, their operations. Now, in, in what uh, remains of, of this talk today, I would like to, to, to challenge a bit this, this very, uh, let's say, strong dichotomy. And uh, I would like basically to, to, to discuss how this idea of transmutation, so this idea of being able of basically transforming, transmuting by metals, base metals into gold and silver, were actually not just a, a question of uh, philosophy, if you want, but where actually this idea was firmly rooted into the materiality of the technology that was developed by ancient uh, alchemists. And this materiality includes both the ingredients that were used in ancient dyeing techniques and also the chromatic changes that metals underwent before the eyes of ancient practitioners. Ancient alchemical recipes are textualized inst instructions that can be properly assessed through a rigorous philological analysis, as well as by means of replications in modern laboratories. 
As we shall see, my, my, I will show you some, some, some experiments that we, we did with, um, with the collaboration of uh, various chemists actually working in the project. This uh, experimental approach does not simply help us to, to, to answer the simple question, does an ancient recipe work? Actually, this is not the, the question that we have in mind. What is important is to, to, to witness, to see basically the chromatic transformation that ancient alchemists were able to see in their workshops and to understand how these experiences, these actually lived experience, experiences, deeply marked the way in which ancient alchemists try to, to describe, conceptualize, and explain metallic transmutation. This is basically, this could be the main, the main focus of the next, of the next um, part of the talk. If we look at the, at the Leiden and Stockholm papyri, for instance, they include recipes on a variety of technologies, if you want, of techniques. And a very important point is the making of coloring baths, in which actually different materials were dipped. So we, we, we have the, 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 the description of, of, of how to produce different dyeing uh, baths used to, to dye wool purple um, by using, uh, without using, sorry, the expensive Turian, Turian uh, dye stuff. According to similar procedures, after being dipped into different dyeing baths, also stones, tabashir for instance, or quartz, were also dyed and according to the recipes were made similar or actually were become uh, gemstones of different kind, which were as good as the, the, the natural ones. For instance, uh, I don't know, burial or, or emeralds and, and so on. So the, the, the expertise that ancient alchemists had with this broad array of dying techniques provided them with different models for conceptualizing chromatic transformations. The using of dyeing baths in which to dip textiles or stones allowed ancient practitioners to work with a broad spectrum of colors and nuances, and also to basically to, to, to discuss how these different dyes could change not only the color of, this, of, the, of the material that was treated, but also the nature of the material themselves. And it's interesting that the use of dyeing bath, so of these uh, basically liquid tinctures into which uh, different materials were dipped, what was also extended, according to the Leiden papyrus, to metals. And uh, in, in the Leiden papyrus, we have a very important and, and interesting recipe, actually, which, which uh, uh, is called the recipe on the making of uh, sulfur water, or let's say the water of, or, or the divine uh, water. This is recipe 87 of the Leiden papyrus, this, this papyrus dating to the third century CE. And let's just read, the, it's a very short recipe, so we can read the, 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 the recipe in, in, in full. Uh, the recipe uh, claims, the discovery of uh, sulfur water or divine water. This is a, a kind of a play in the Greek word, because in the Greek language, because uh, the term Greek, the Greek term theion means both sulfur and divine. So the alchemists were, were playing with this double meaning of the term. So the discovery of the sulfur water makes one drachma of quicklime, the same quantity of sulfur that has been crumbled in a vessel containing strong vinegar or the urine of a virgin boy. The liquid is then burned by applying fire below, so has to make it like blood. Filter to remove sediment and employ it neat. This recipe has two very interesting, uh, let's say, elements. The first point that I would like to, to highlight is the use of the term discover sulfur water. So this is a very peculiar use of the term Eurysis discovery in the Leiden papyrus, because this is the only recipe where we have 
this term among the 160 recipes that are basically collected in these two alchemical papyri. And unfortunately, we don't know, I mean, the recipe doesn't tell us the name of the discoverer, of the person who discovered this, this dying solution. We will come back to this point in, in a moment, but it's important to highlight, to stress this, this element. The second point is that basically the, the recipe doesn't explain how to use this water. But according to uh, contemporary sources, especially if we compare this recipe with basically the, uh, the, the, the works by Zosimus, we know that the silver was, was mainly treated with this divine water, with this sulfur water. We actually tried to, to in different steps, actually in different moments, we tried to, to uh, replicate this recipe, to test this recipe in laboratory. This is actually a work that uh, I'm, I'm, we are carrying out both in, um, in Bologna at the, at the Department of Chemistry with different colleagues, Luciana Ini, Mariana Marchini, Giacomo Montanari, who are working um, in the framework of the um, ERC project. And part of these replications were made, were carried out in, uh, at the, lab in the laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University with the Professor Lawrence Principe, that I'm sure many of you already know is a pioneer in, in, the, in the replication of alchemical recipes. And uh, if you look actually at, at the recipe and we, we follow the instruction of, of, uh, of, our, of our recipe, we, we, we mix the sulfur and, and quicklime in the urine and vinegar. And after boiling and filtering it, it was actually possible to make a solution that, is, as the recipe claims, is red, is as red as blood. You can see actually the true solution basically you know, made with urine or with vinegar in the picture in the slide. We also tried to use this, this, uh, this uh, solution this, to uh, dye, to transform, if you want, a silver coin into, into gold. And after a little practice, it's actually possible to dye a silver coin, as you can see here, in a color that is very similar to gold. This, this, is, this is the half of the, of, the, of the coin was actually dipped into this, let's say, red divine water. We will come back in a moment to some technical details of this, of this replication. For now, I would like to, to highlight again how the recipe in the Leiden papyrus basically um, stresses that this water of sulfur was discovered by, by someone without specifying the name of this author. So it's difficult actually to understand who is the discoverer who is, or the first person who used this divine water. But we have some, some, some elements that might point to the work of Pseudo-Democritus, to these four books, um, these four, book, four alchemical books attributed to Pseudo-Democritus as a possible candidate, if you want, for the discovery of this, of this, of this uh, um, let's say, uh, divine water. In, in, in fact, in the, in the two books on the making of gold and the making of silver, uh, Pseudo-Democritus draws this very sharp distinction between taxeria, so the, 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 basically the dry traps that were used to dye metals. And from this term, xeria, actually, we have the modern elixir uh, through uh, an Arabic, uh, uh, let's say, translation as for chimia, alchimia. And the second uh, category, let's say, of substances that was, was um, distinguished by, by Pseudo-Democritus is hois domoi. Domoi means sauce, basically, or soup. Is, is, is a term that was borrowed by the kitchen vocabulary in alchemy and uh, is used by Pseudo-Democritus specifically to refer to liquid ingredients, to liquid drugs or dyes. Now, this distinction between, uh, let's say, dry and humid or moist drugs 
was used by Pseudodemocritus in his classification of the, of the recipes. So recipes in the two books are divided in, into two parts, the, the ones that basically are based on, on the dry drugs and the, the recipes based on liquid drugs. But we also have lists of ingredients at the beginning of the two books that are divided according to this classification. And if, you, if we look at the list of, uh, let's say, of Zomomi, so of the liquid uh, um, uh, drugs that were used to, to dye uh, metals, we, we have a very long list of, uh, of, uh, of uh, let's say, ingredients, but we have also water of quicklime and water of pure or untouched sulfur, which are the two main ingredients, basically, of the divine water. And in another catalog, actually, Pseudodemocritus combine, combines the two, the two uh, waters, and actually it talks about uh, water produced, uh, sulfur water produced with the quicklime. So we might maybe, we might consider that this technology of divine waters was somehow linked to the sections of Pseudodemocritus, where he described this, these dying techniques based on the use of the oil of liquids. And uh, actually, if we look uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the words by Zosimos of Panopolis, we have uh, in the Syriac translation a full book devoted to the use, to the, to the technology of divine water, of the water of sulfur, actually, is in, in Syriac is Mia de Kibrita. And um, in this book is the nine book, of, of Zosimus of Panopoli preserved in Syriac translation. And actually this book is, is opened by, by a catalog of uh, liquids, of waters, that is very similar to the catalog that we have in the, uh, in the, in, in the Pseudodemocritus alchemical books. Moreover, actually, um, Zosimus also reports in the same section a full recipe of this water of sulfur that is uh, basically almost uh, the same or very similar to the recipe that we have uh, in the Leiden papyrus. So we can see basically how this kind of technology was transmitted throughout the centuries. It was passed from a source to another, from an alchemist to another with a very slight small changes. For instance, if you look, I won't read the full recipe, it's a bit long, but if you look at the, at the recipe, you can see that the ratio between quicklime and sulfur is a bit different. It's not one to one, but it's two to one. And also the kind of, um, of uh, ingredient of liquid that is used is not uh, urine or uh, vinegar, but it's simply uh, water. We also replicate this recipe by Zosimus in Bologna, actually, and this is the, what, the kind of, of, uh, of uh, uh, red water that you can produce, and also the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, dyeing procedure or the, the color that you can achieve, this golden color that you can achieve, you can see on a silver coin dipped into this uh, this uh, dying, dying uh, solution. Now, um, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the procedure, actually, this procedure consists in heating 100, 150 uh, Celsius degree for all, almost two hours, a solution containing calcium oxide and powdery sulfur in water. After the addition of calcium oxide to the water solution, it is necessary to wait for a few minutes in order to have the conversion into calcium hydroxide. The ratio between calcium oxide and sulfur here is two to one. At the end of the reaction, when the solution turns reddish, as you can see, it is filtered when it's still hot and the silver coin, when well cleaned, is dipped into this filtered hot solution, and the result is the formation, formation of this goldish layer on the silver coin. Basically, this divine water reaction heals the formation of polysulfide, of calcium polysulfide. When they react with silver, 
The reaction leads to the formation of a thin layer of, sul of silver sulfate. Now silver sulfate is black, is black. However, if this layer is very thin of the order of 10, 100 nanomillimeter, a golden yellow color is detectable on the, is, it can be observed on the surface of this, of this coin due to interference of light. The optimal result is obtained when the silver surface is well cleaned. Actually, very similar procedures are still described in, in modern, sorry, this is the, the explanation, solution of, this is a solution of calcium polysulfate, and this is the very thin layer of silver sulfate. Actually, very similar solutions are still described in modern uh, chemical literature. This is an article that we find from the, uh, the um, uh, 2018, actually, published in the Russian Journal of Applied chemistry. And this is the relevant passage on the, on the production of uh, this kind of uh, sulfur water. And actually, uh, as was already observed by Lorenz Principe, uh, different elements can, can uh, have an impact on, on the color of the, of the coin. When a, indeed, as Lorenz Principe writes, when a polished piece of silver is steeped into this liquid, the metal quickly becomes tawny, then golden, then coppery, then bronzy, purple, and fin finally brown. Impressively, the shiny brilliance of the metal remains undiminished by the color changes until the very end, and the color and sheen remain stable for a long period of time. And, um, and actually, these are just some examples of the colors that we were able to, to, to achieve, actually, to produce during our experiments. Now, we can argue now that after observing these chromatic changes that silver underwent when dipped in the dying bath and witnessing its various shades of gold, ancient alchemists tried to conceptualize the spectrum of transformation they were able to achieve. The stability and the shade of the produced colors depended on various factors which alchemists attempted to analyze and explain. How deep can the dyeing mixture penetrate? Did an inner dye lead to a complete transformation of the treated material? This reasoning clearly emerges in the books of Pseudo-Democritus. In a very interesting passage, actually, Pseudo-Democritus warned young practitioners against a distracted and a hasty approach to the art of alchemy and drew an instructive comparison with the method of physicians. Young practitioners must approach the, st the study of natural substances with good judgment and follow the, examples, the example of physicians who test the ingredients, detect their main qualities, and choose those that are most appropriate for the disease they want to heal. Likewise, the good alchemist must know which substances can produce stable and deep tinctures. This is actually the passage by Pseudo-Democritus. At the very beginning, there is this, uh, let's say, this uh, complaint against young practitioner, young men, who are misled and distrustful of this writing, of the writing of Pseudo-Democritus, since they do, do not follow the example of the students of physicians, and the students of physicians want to, to, to test the properties of all the drugs they are using when they make a beneficial, let's say, medicine. On the contrary, the, these young alchemists do not carry out, as they should, actually, any close examination of the species. And this is an interesting, uh, these are interesting lines that can help us to understand the kind of reasoning behind these dying procedures by ancient alchemists. This close examination of the species, for example, whether one species can cleanse, another can be applied, whether one species can die, and with respect to brightness, whether it is vanishing and vanishes from inside, and whether one species can resist fire and another one mixed can make things fire resistant. There is all this reasoning behind about the, 
the, the possible, uh, let's say, uh, interaction between this uh, dying solution like the dying water and the metals that was treated with these, with these, uh, with these uh, uh, solutions, with these uh, uh, waters or alchemical waters. Uh, before uh, reaching some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, sorry, of general uh, conclusion, let me check, let me show you another example, very, very briefly, of, of uh, another alchemical recipe that was used to, to dye, uh, let's say, copper into silver, because this is very interesting to, 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 to draw kind of provisional conclusion. This is a, a recipe by Pseudo-Democritus taken, taken from the book on the making of silver, and uh, we have basically the production of a zomos, so of a liquid dye, into which to dip a metallic uh, leaf, leaf that is probably a copper leaf. And in order to actually remove the shadow from this, from this metallic leaf, a metallic leaf that is described as shadowy, that will become shadowless after this treatment. We, we tried also this recipe and um, we put, these are all the ingredients that are listed in the recipe, basically, in um, minerals, plants, and, and liquids. We used these uh, four minerals, so or piment, soda, salt, and alum. We used basically these two uh, plants. And as for liquids, we didn't use urine. We also we only used vinegar and filtrate of quicklime. Quicklime is an important ingredient for the divine water as well. We prepared this, this domos, this kind of soup, if you want, so this dying liquid. And then we try to understand what actually uh, Pseudo-Democritus means when he claims deep into this wash, into the moss, the shadowy metallic leaves while heating them, and you will make them shadowless. The two, two interpretations were proposed. According to some scholar, this shadow was a kind of uh, oxidation. Basically, the, the, these copper leaves were oxidized, and so this liquid was used to clean, to cleanse the copper. According to a second interpretation, this is actually a, a recipe to transform, to dye, say, copper white by making it similar to, to silver, so basically by transmuting it into silver according to the alchemical interpretation. We tried actually uh, both. We, we, we tried to basically to put uh, an oxidized copper leaf in this uh, solution, but nothing happened. When we try to actually um, put a simple, not an oxidized, but a well, a well cleaned copper leaves in the solution made actually with the filtrate of quicklime, this is an under important point, not made, the, the one with vinegar doesn't work, we were able to produce a color, as you can see in these uh, images, that is quite similar to silver. So we might maybe, according to this, to this uh, recipe, to this uh, replication, we might suppose that actually Democritus was conceptualizing the transformation of, of uh, copper into silver as a procedure that wanted to, to get rid of the shadow that uh, was covering the metal. So by removing the shadow, it was possible to transform copper into, into, into silver. And a possible, and this is the last point that I will make, a possible uh, confirmation, if you want, of this interpretation can be taken from the Arabic tradition. Since actually, according to uh, Zosimus in, in the Tom of Images, so in this dialogue between Zos Zosimus and Theosebeia, um, preserved in the Arabic tradition, uh, Zosimus claims concerning the removal of the shadow he, so pseudo-democritus actually, ordered you to make it white as the shadow can be removed by the sulfur as well as by the mercury. So the idea, according at least to this interpretation of, of Zosimus, is to use this thomos, this liquid, to remove the shadow of copper and then make it white, make it of the color 
of silver. And actually, Zosimus also, if you want, uh, makes uh, a step forward in, in this interpretation, because in, in, an, in other passages, this is just one of the many passages uh, that could be selected for this last point, Zosimus actually claims that all the, the uh, liquids that were mentioned by Pseudodemocritus in his writings are different kinds of water, of sulfurs. And I think actually that this interpretation is very important for us to understand how this idea of transmutation started to be developed in these earlier, earliest phases of alchemy. Since these, uh, these ancient practitioners realized that by using specific kinds of, of solutions, especially solutions made with sulfur and other sulfides like orpiment, real guard, they were able to produce kind of stable transformation of the metals that were that were treated not simply a pain or you know a kind of you know a dye a superficial dye or, or something that can be easily removed there is a, a natural we would say today chemical reaction between these these solutions and the metal and this kind of uh, deeper according to, to ancient alchemists and stable transformation was probably the basis on which this idea of metallic transmutation was developed. Thank you very much for the attention. Sorry if I spoke a bit too much, but this, this, that's all. Thank you. Um, Matty opened that wonderful talk. Um, I think what a lot of our viewers would be very pleased about, yeah, but some of our earlier talks on alchemy haven't really gone into the experimental chemistry, as it were. So I think that we'll have several, probably have several people in this audience, I'm thinking particularly of you, Jeff Seaman, who will be very pleased to see some real, real chemistry taking place. So thank sure, you very much thanks. for that. Wonderful illustrations as well. I was very impressed by the quality of your illustrations. Now, Matteo, can you read the chat, okay, or shall I read them out for you? I can read the the the, 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 yeah, the, the, the chat. Um, yeah. Do you want to make any comments? Some of yeah, so comments on the quick. first question, it's very interesting that in Korean, Kim means gold. I didn't know. I'm not sure that there is any connection with the, with the Egyptian, uh, the Greek word, because the connection between Greece and Far East it's quite uh, complicated uh, for this period, but thank you for the, I, I will look it up actually. And um, yeah, this is in, actually the sulfur water looking like blood reminds me of one of the allotropes of sulfur, molten sulfur, which is red. Indeed, it's, we, at the moment actually, we are working on some possible connection between what is called today the, the, the um, the liver of sulfur that is very often used in, in, uh, in by, by, by artists working with metals and this uh, solution of divine water. Because it, it's true that uh, also the, 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 um, the liver of sulfur at some point becomes this kind of reddish orange color. And uh, when you melt sulfur, it's, it's also beautiful to look at it. And, and I'm, I'm, my, my idea is that many of the ancient alchemical texts were actually like speculating on this uh, chromatic transformation that ancient alchemists were just uh, looking at, witnessing in their, in their workshops, basically. The, the kind of language that is used, of course, is very distant from modern chemistry, but if we can understand the practice, we can also better understand the theories and the way in which these, these practices were described. And uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't read the, the following, but it's, uh, my, my comment is also about the, the perhaps liver of sulfur. This was exactly what I have in mind. And uh, thank you, Open Rigs. Of, and, uh, I don't know this industrial pollutant Galligu, but I would be very interested to know more about it. Sorry, uh, this well, is Galligu a is the waste product of the Leblanc process, where you take sodium sulfide and heat it with lime and coal, and that produces calcium polysulfide and so soda, which is what you want. And the calcium polysulfide and lots of other horrible things are then dumped uh, by the riverside in the old days. I'm talking about the 19th century now. And it's called Galligan. 
Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's very interesting. I will, I will look at this because it, I, I'm very curious about the possible, uh, you know, connection between these technologies. Now, how, how long lasting are these technologies, basically? And this, uh, um, did you analyze the final, red, the final red solution employed to dye your coin? How long is stable? And this is a good question. It's, we did analyze the, the red solution and we, we, we could detect calcium polysulfide basically in, the, in, in, the, in, in this solution. This is also what makes basically the solution red. I mean, from orange to, to red, the color depends also on temperature. And um, how long is stable? This is a good question. We, I mean, uh, the same color could last at least for several weeks. That's for sure because <laughs> the first experiments were performed more, almost two months ago, for instance, some of the pictures that I show you, the, 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 the color is still there. We have some samples in the, in the laboratory, but I have no idea actually how long. One of the question is why we never found something similar in archeological findings, for instance. A possible question is that this, this uh, dye is, is stable, but not so stable to, you know, to survive throughout the centuries, I guess. But this is, maybe I'm not the best person to, to, to answer this question. A chemist or, or archaeometallurgist uh, will know better than me this, this kind of technical, uh, let's say, point. We are trying to also work with archaeometallurgists to, 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 to address this, this, this more historical or archaeological say, uh, problems, actually. Well, then I might be it, in fact. Now, are we done? I'd just like to make two announcements. The first announcement is, you see this book here? It's the Cultural History of Chemistry and Antiquity. Now, those of you who've been with us from the beginning will know that we started with Volume 6, when I gave two talks based on Volume 6. And now Matteo is one of the major contributors to Volume 1. Now there's a very good bit of news about Volume 1, folks. And that is, it's a very expensive volume. At the moment, you would have to fork out about £350, $400 to get the whole set of sticks. It will be broken up eventually. It probably will be remained eventually. But, but, only in the case of Volume 1, it's available online. Free. Got its open access because of a project that Matteo and his colleagues are working on has to be open access. So if you want to hop foot to the internet, search for cultural history of chemistry and antiquity, it will usually be at the top of your search list and you can download your very own PDF of this volume. So you can go away and read in detail to, uh, more about the sort of things that Matteo has been talking about and to compare them to Mesopotamia and to Egypt. Uh, Asian Egypt, that is, rather than Greco-Roman Egypt. Now, this brings me very neatly to my second announcement. Next month, things are going to be topsy-turvy. Instead of having this kind of talk, this historical talk, on um, the fourth Sunday, fourth, sorry, I say Sunday, fourth Tuesday of the month, it will be on the third Tuesday of the month. So it will be at the normal time for our normal talk. The reason for this is that Matteo is going all the way to Wellness for the International Conference for the History of Chemistry next month, so he can't make the 23rd. So he'll be talking with a colleague of his, Eduardo Esteban, on the 16th of May, and they'll have an absolutely fascinating question to answer. Where did chemistry begin? So they will be debating between themselves, what, what it, did it start in Mesopotamia? Did it start in Egypt? Can we actually trace? where chemistry actually began. So please join us for that talk on the 16th of May. But don't go away, because on the 23rd of May, instead of this normal series, we have our normal talk, which will be by Jeff Rayner Canem, who incidentally has just been awarded the ACS, the ACS, his ACS Award in the History of Chemistry with his wife. And he will be talking about the woman chemist Harriet Brooks who was active in the early 20th century. So please come along again on the 23rd of May to hear Jeff, Jim, Jeff Rainer Canem. And if you remember him talking about the Inuit uh, last year, he is a very good speaker. So we'll have two excellent talks coming up next month. Please join us. 
And in the meantime, thank you very much again, Matteo, for such a wonderful talk with lots of experimental detail. And thank you everybody for coming along and a good afternoon or good morning wherever you are and goodbye for now. Bye everybody. Have a thank good you time. all. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.